All right, so it's been about a year since I first got my electric unicycle. Um, I think I'm at about 100, or not 100, 850 kilometers. So I've, I've been riding it pretty regularly. There was a period of time where I, I wasn't able to ride it. Uh, so far, I've tried two different tires. I've gone through three different tubes. Uh, changing the tire is quite a trip on one of these electric unicycles just because it's, it's not like a motorcycle tire to where you, you can just take the, the wheel off and replace the tube, pretty simple. Um, the whole motor is inside the wheel, inside the rim, um, which means you have to <laughs> remove the entire motor from the vehicle, which is unlike any other kind of vehicle I've ever dealt with. Um, but you got to remove the entire motor assembly. You got to disarm the board before that. You got to make sure you don't zap yourself with the batteries, which all unicycles vary, but mine's got some pretty standard uh, connectors that I've seen like on uh, like model, model, like RC model cars. I, I forget the, the standard for it. It's a, it's a Japanese style connector. Um, and airsoft rifles use like the smaller version of it. I just can't remember the name of it. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a pretty safe connector. Disarming it's pretty easy. You just disconnect the battery and try to turn it on a few times and it'll remove whatever power is left in those three giant capacitors on the board. Um, man, I don't know, remember where I'm supposed to go from here. I think I was supposed to cross. Or at least I thought it would be the hard part. The hard part is it's not like any other kind of dirt bike rim to where you can you can get your spoons around the same way and the spokes and all that. Uh, you can't use a tire press. You just have to have a really good spoon kit. I recommend three. And it's still kind of difficult because that motor takes up so much of the inner space inside the rim and there's no spokes to hook, to hook your uh, spoons on as you're working. Uh, so I bought a larger tire, slightly larger, more roadworthy, but still an all-terrain tire. And that wasn't coming off, so I cut the tire to get it off. Um, and because of that, I ended up putting the original tire back on, which actually, I'm kind of liking it more than the other tire. It doesn't rub at all. Um, it's just, if I ever have to replace that original Kenda, it's gonna be kind of hard to find a replacement. Yeah, I was supposed to cross back there. Uh, we'll see how this works. I just want to go over some of the features that I've upgraded on this since the year I've had it in almost a thousand kilometers. Um, the most important that I found is this fender that I've designed and 3D printed. Uh, this unicycle does not come with a kickstand and even the ones that do are kind of pathetic. Let me, can I change the exposure? No. Um, so this is both a fender. I don't ride this in the rain, but sometimes I ride it after the rain and that's probably fine water-wise. Um, sorry, I keep sniffling. But this, this keeps 100% off the water off my backpack because the first time I rode through a damp road, not even a puddle or anything, it kept flinging water straight up onto the bottom of my backpack and it was completely soaked by the time I got home. Uh, so this stops all the splash starting all the way from down here and also kicking up rocks and stuff like that. One downside is I made this tolerance really tight because it's also the kickstand. Uh, so once one time a rock got caught in between and it was enough to pop it off. Uh, but otherwise it hasn't broken off since then. I've gone through three iterations of this. This is the final one. Uh, this one, I've mounted it. It popped off because of the rock, and then I tried to make it magnetic mount, but then the adhesive holding the magnets to this broke off, and it was kind of annoying because sometimes if I put it on its kickstand, it would just pop the fender off because the magnets could slip. They don't have a lot of strength that way. So that was my tire situation. By the way, coming up on a stop sign here. Uh, 
I don't know how the audio is going to sound on this. Uh, I have a road or a first generation road H1 or whatever. Or not road, uh, Zoom H1. And then I have a road lap mic kind of on my scarf or my SMA up inside my helmet as much as possible. Uh, and it's got two windscreens on it. So, and then I also have the stereo sound coming from my uh, H or DJI Pocket 2. Uh, I tried to pipe audio directly into my Pocket 2, uh, but even though it has USB-C, it doesn't do USB-C things. So if I plug a USB-C ADC audio to digital converter into the bottom of the, the Pocket 2, it doesn't recognize it as a, a microphone. Um, but also, I have the, Ro the Rode Smart Lab or whatever, so it's a TRRS connection. So it fools your smart device into thinking that it is a headset, uh, but only the microphone side of the headset is obviously audio. But my phone, which worked, my iPhone with the iPhone adapter has worked with a TRRS headset before, and it recognizes it as headphones, and it takes the, the microphone audio in. For some reason on the Rode Smart Lab, it's not working on my iPhone 15. Uh, so I have to have a separate recorder, which makes editing so much more fun. Uh, but I guess as long as there's not too much wind in the camera microphone, I can just add it as some more background sound, I guess. As far as range and charging goes, uh, I only charge my battery to 80%. And the charger it came with, the little five amp charger, it was really sketchy. I picked it up and it weighed as much as a Dixie cup, which doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. Just because it means that, like, how is how is it converting that efficiently without that much weight? So I'm not sponsoring Alien Rides, but I did order one of his chargers, one of his 100 volt chargers, because this is a 100 volt system. And I love it. It, it weighs like it actually has a bulky transformer and capacitors in it. Uh, so it has a nice weight to it, which means good things are going on inside there by the, the old school standard. Uh, but most importantly, it has two knobs that have two different functions. One of them is how much capacity you want to charge your battery to. So when it cuts off, uh, it has 80, 90, and 100. Personally, 90 seems kind of useless. I charged to 80%. Okay. I charged to 80% to prolong the longevity of my battery packs and to reduce the, the chance of fire because those are kind of going on around with lithium batteries right now and cheaper devices. Uh, the other is how many amps it charges the battery by. So by normal lithium battery standards, whatever your your amperage output, you're only supposed to charge at 10% that, which with the stock charger, it puts out five amps. And the wheel is rated to charge up to 10 amps if you have two of those chargers. So with normal lithium battery standards, whatever your milliamp hour battery rating is, is how many amps you're supposed to charge by. So I'm not an expert on this, but I'm pretty sure this battery is only supposed to be charging at like 3.2 amps. And the stock charger comes with a five amp charger. So I personally just charge it on the lowest amp rating. Because I, I, I spent $4,000 on this. I want, it, I want it to last at least 10 years without any battery, noticeable battery degradation. Uh, so I, I charge at three amps and I only charge to 80%. And with the 100 mile range on the Sherman, like that hasn't been any, hasn't been a problem at all. And I usually recharge it once the battery's at 50%, uh, just because you can start getting performance decreases uh, around 50%. Uh, but yeah even though I'm undercharging it, hasn't really been an issue just because of how massive the battery already is in this thing. Uh, second, or let me show you the kickstand. Turn it off so it doesn't freak out. So you basically just lean it back. And there you go, super, 
sturdy kickstand. Uh, I think all electric unicycles should come with a fender kickstand like this rather than the flimsy one that some of them come with. Let's turn it back on. Gotta switch arms real quick. I've been holding my right arm straight out for a while. Um, but I also forgot to re-mention again, this is the veteran Sherman Max. I don't know if they're still making it. Uh, this is over a year after I've purchased it, which is, was, it was all, all, already a couple months old. So I think it's already a two year old model um, by the time this video gets published. Um, but it's solid. It's literally built like a tank. Uh, as far as crashes go, I've had at least five. Two of them were really fucking bad, uh, not hospital bad, but I probably should have gone to the hospital bad. Um, I had a couple of minor wipeouts, I guess more than five, um, especially like on dirt trails. I've dumped it a lot. I've dumped it dozens of times, usually like five miles an hour or less. Um, and it's held up just fine. It's scuffed to hell. It's got tons of personality to it now. Uh, but that's not a bad thing, always, um, as long as it's still functional. Uh, I'll show you later all my upgrades that I've done to it, all my necessary upgrades, at least what I deem necessary. Uh, I lost a button, or at least the rubber cap on the button, uh, just by mounting it upside down, or leaning it upside down, it, it somehow ripped the button off. Uh, but yeah, besides the tires, nothing's broken on it. Uh, while I was doing a lighting job, which again, I'll show you later, uh, I wired the flashing light, the flashing front light, which is useless anyways, originally to my auxiliary lights. So I could just turn on and off the auxiliary lights with the flashing light. And apparently that was too much wattage and it, it killed that side of the circuit. So the headlight works, just not the flashing lights. But my, uh, my auxiliary lights are just fine too. Second major upgrade is these lights. I tried to do flashing lights and everything and I couldn't get them to sync up uh, like fake police lights, but orange, or I guess uh, construction hazard lights. They had like 20 different flashing things and a sync cable, but I could never get the sync cable to work. I even made like a little button and everything on there to change the modes and they would go through once and uh, once per cycle, one of them would lose sync until all four of them were on different flashing modes. So I got rid of those. Uh, these are just turn signal running lights, so they have one mode that they're dim and one that they're bright for the flash. Uh, I actually have them in dim mode, and they are bright enough to light up the area around my wheel, uh, which is great for visibility, and when it's pitch black outside, you can see the area immediately around you. Uh, and plus, I don't, I already burnt out the part that makes this part flash, and I didn't want to burn out the headlight circuit, so they're on the dimmest setting. Um, maybe in the future I'll add a button that switches modes or a momentary or three-way switch, but realistically on the dim settings, they're bright enough. Uh, I had a few, I, I, I would say three medium intensity spills where basically I, I was going at least like around 10 miles an hour when I had to bail off and like the, the wheel went tumbling and I went basically sprinting to, to try to keep up, uh, but medium damage to the wheel, but it's still fully functional. My two bad ones were when I, the first one was when I was first learning. Um, I was going like maybe 15, finally getting my courage up and I started getting the wobbles. So just like any other bike, I tried bailing out before getting into an accident. Well, you can't bail on this thing because the missile always knows where it is. Uh, and when I bailed, I was barely staying on my toes and it did a complete 180 and it took out my ankles. Uh, that, was, that was pretty painful. I probably, I think I pulled something that time. Um, I was in a little bit of pain for a couple of weeks. And then after I was very confident on it, I got my first flat tire. With that flat tire, it was just slowly losing air after a while, and I kept topping it off. It was like every other day I needed to top it off. But then suddenly coming back from work one day, uh, it just decided to completely go flat while I was riding home. 
and there's a sharp right turn that I take up into my driveway every day. And I usually take it pretty hard because it's the last turn at the end of my ride. And I took it pretty hard and the wheel folded out from underneath me. And I, I basically reverse lawn chaired, or I guess it's not reverse, I lawn chaired on top of the, the, the wheel and I'm pretty sure I cracked a rib. Uh, I should have gone to the hospital, but I kept taking deep breaths and pushing in on my ribs to see where it was cracked, but it hurt for like two weeks to breathe. Um, but that was, that was basically the worst accident that I got into. Uh, and the third major modification I made to this um, is these power pads. I designed and 3D printed these myself because these pads are essential. I've obviously left them on for a reason, but they, they suck. They only control your upper leg, um, but going over bumps and stuff, my foot would hop off the pad, and I really don't like that. So I have these power pads, which give me better traction with my shoes or my boots. Um, I would say these are 100% essential on any unicycle you buy. There should be factory ones with all of them, but this is what I came with. And I still leave these on because this feels good on my, my upper leg. Um, and I mounted them as high as possible. Uh, you can see my, my janky gaff tape job trying to hide all my wires. It doesn't look bad, but it also looks bad. As far as uh, daily riding goes, um, the wheel goes 45 miles an hour, but I rarely do that. Uh, I have my the beeping set at about 30 miles an hour or about 35. I do 30 miles an hour and I have the tilt back set at 40 because um, my daily commute to work is only like a mile and a half away and it's on a 30 mile an hour road. So it's, that's super easy for me. Uh, it's not super easy for everybody. Uh, the bike paths in Tucson are trash. It's your, it's your, uh, your painted line bike path that has no improvements to it whatsoever. And with that, the first time I was riding in that bike lane, um, I ended up getting my shirt clipped by a mirror. So I haven't been in the, the roadside bike lanes ever since then. Uh, fourth improvement I made after one of my buttons got eaten by, I don't even remember where I lost it, but I had it sitting upside down, I think on my motorcycle seat or in the back of my truck, and the rubber cap on the button just completely peeled off, so I have to push way deep down in there to use the, the menu settings there. Um, one of these is menu, one of them is cycle through settings. I forget which is which. I haven't used it since I set it. This is pretty much set it and forget it. I set my beep at 35 miles an hour and my tilt back at 40, and it can ultimately do 45 miles an hour, uh, but I usually do 30. So they're all in increments of five. And my headlights button still works, and my power button. Um, so I basically used alien tape it's a really squishy, gooey, double-sided tape to kind of build a brim around the buttons, and then I put gaff tape over it. So if it's laying flat, the buttons aren't being pushed, um, and also the gaff tape over them means they can't be sheared off anymore like this one. Uh, but for range-wise, I usually ride to work and back doing 30 miles an hour most of the way. Um, and I'm charging it to 80% and it takes me about a week to get down to like maybe 60% and then I charge it from there and then on the weekend even at 3 amps um, usually about 4 hours will get it back up to 80% because I'm using the minimum charging speed uh, to prolong battery life uh, so so range is really good on this um, the longest bike path ride I've been on has been about 50 miles and that time I think I charged it to 100% just because I knew I was going to be out there for a while. Um, and even then I went 50 miles and it got down to probably like 30% uh, just because I was going fast in some areas. And I think the 100 mile range is rated at 15 miles an hour. Uh, my grip tapes 
are getting pretty, they're pretty sharp still, uh, but they're, it's starting to peel up in the corner and I ended up just cutting it so it would stop peeling and it started peeling again. Uh, this side's doing a lot better, but yeah, I might, I don't know if they still make foot pads for this or not, but I might get the foot pads, but I do also like the factory ones because they just, they just fit up in there and they work. And I haven't really had an issue with them since I put these power pads on, so I'll probably leave those. And they're, they're friendly with Crocs, which I ironically ride this a lot in. Speaking of the devil, I forgot that this part of the Tucson bike loop has one of these shitty unimproved bike lanes. Uh, it's usually the worst part of the road because it's where all the cracks start to develop. So you got potholes, cracks, everything you don't want. And then it's just a singular line dividing you between traffic. So I'm going to ride on the sidewalk. I'm not getting killed today. I kind of lied a little bit earlier about the range that I've done on this. Uh, I'm actually at 918 kilometers. So I've almost made a thousand kilometers on this thing. Um, I kind of wanted to do this video at a thousand kilometers, but I have a four day weekend. So I'm doing it now. Man, this whole section of road is just no bike lane. Uh, I do remember this side of the path does somehow get back into a bike lane. I just don't remember where. And then it goes under the highway. And then it ends at the new development neighborhood on the other side of the highway. As far as gear goes, um, the first time I took this shopping with me, I left it, left it outside, locked up and everything. Uh, and I had my helmet, which is just a regular Bontrager bicycle helmet, sitting on a bench next to it. And I meant to bring that in the store with me, but I forgot it. And I was in the store for 15 minutes, maybe 20, and the helmet got stolen. So I didn't have the mountain bike helmet. And even before that, I decided that because of the speeds I'm doing and because of the few times I wiped out, you have to wear a motorcycle helmet. Do not wear DOT, wear Snell or ECE rated. DOT is just as safe as a bicycle helmet. So don't wear DOT, wear Snell or ECE, wear a motorcycle helmet. Uh, but even before then I decided that, but the grocery store was like a mile away. So I just wore the bicycle helmet to keep things simple. And yeah, that got stolen. So now I don't even have a choice on what kind of helmet I wear except between my two motorcycle helmets. I personally prefer the motocross helmet because you have more peripheral uh, visibility. I can lock my eyes all the way to the left and I can barely see the edge. Um, this is a Snell rated helmet. A lot of companies don't make Snell anymore because they don't require it on the tracks. And I think ECE has an even wider uh, vision port. So if you get an ECE motocross helmet, uh, that would be my suggestion. Also on warmer days, it's got a lot of good breathing and stuff to it too. And it's pretty lightweight. On colder days, I wear my uh, motorcycle helmet and it's nice because it keeps the wind and everything out of ears too uh, so yeah definitely wear a motorcycle helmet well I finally made my way back to the actual loop apparently I don't know the Tucson loops kind of weird I was on a sub loop uh, because the loop actually keeps going back behind me but the main wash that I came from is also part of the loop so I don't know how that works Unless there is a split that I miss, but I've taken this route three times already. I don't think I missed anything. For your top, if you're going hard, wear a motorcycle jacket. Um, it's actually kind of cold today, so I wore my motorcycle jacket anyways. Even though I'm on a bicycle trail, I'm not going hard. Um, this one looks like a regular flannel. It's made by Speed and Strength, but it's got uh, 3DO pads in the elbows, uh, the shoulders, and the back, just in case you have a nasty spill. As far as off-roading with the wheel goes, um, it's better than, I, I would say it's as good as a 20 inch wheel bike without suspension. Uh, it's better than a mountain bike because of the lack of effort, but it doesn't have any suspension and it's ultimately a 20 inch wheel. Uh, so you can go off-road with it. I've, I think I already put out a video of Reddington as I was, that was like my second time riding, so I was forcing myself to learn faster. 
Um, but I've since, there, there's like a little mountain bike trail that's really smooth. And that one's a lot of fun. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of fun on BMX, trails that are friendly for BMX or dirt, jump, dirt jumpers. I haven't taken it off any jumps. Uh, one, because I don't want to break my wheel. And two, I don't want to break myself. Uh, but like BMX smooth tracks, smooth enough for BMX bikes are great for the wheel. Um, if you're going hard, definitely wear boots um, or prolonged rides. I just wear Crocs to like the grocery store and back, but I wear boots any other time that I'm going more than like two miles because you, it does fatigue you after a while. Um, other than that, I really don't have too much else to say about the wheel. I guess I'll just get some uh, B-roll footage for some other parts in the video and that's about it. One year update, almost a thousand kilometers. It's a great transportation device as long as your local speed limit going to and from work is 30 miles an hour or you have a protected bike path that either has at least a berm in between the street um, or is completely separated from the street. Otherwise, I would not trust regular bike paths. It's not worth getting killed on a roadside bike path that only has a single singular painted line as a divider. Uh, but that's it. See it. Uh, long pants if you're going hard or longer distances like I am today. But yeah, for the most part, just wear lightweight motorcycle gear and you'll be fine with it.